Um, hello, everyone. Good afternoon to all of you. Welcome to SOAS. My name is Ali Alavi. I'm a co director of the Center for Indian Studies and a lecturer at the Middle Eastern Studies at the School of Languages, Cultures, and Linguistics. Uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, welcome and introduce uh, honorable speakers. Uh, quite an exciting book, I should say, which uh, Venetia, Dr. Venetia, and Porter will discuss more. Uh, just in two lines, I take the opportunity to take advantage of this um, time and just introduce SOAS Center for Iranian Studies. It's been established more than a decade ago and is one of the unique area studies center. A uh, handful institutions in the world to have such centers, such as St. Andrews and Yale University, and uh, I believe Columbia University as well in the United States. Uh, the center connects academics, researchers, and students, and also offers various programs, such as the master's degree in Iranian studies, and also which is supported by scholarships, and works with the Zoroastrian uh, Center and the SOAS Middle East Institute, where there is quite uh, very well known globally. Uh, I lead with the Dr. Venusha Porter, who was a senior curator at a British Museum and quite ve very well known, whomever studied Islamic arts, Middle Eastern arts, in that regard, it's a great honor. Professor Amit Dabashi, no need to introduce, if I want to introduce him and list his books, it will take us up to tomorrow morning, and I have to list his books and I'm reviewing your book, Professor Dabashi, on uh, Persian Prince, which is uh, taking all my time, but I'm enjoying it. Um, and then, of course, my good colleague, uh, Hamid, um, is here, the author of the book, and mm -hmm. Azale, which is a, also an artist and have works, amazing works that have been exhibited in uh, high profile institutions in Ontario, in Canada, in, uh, and the United Kingdom and the West. So I leave it with you. And then, please. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for this, uh, for hosting us here. Uh, Ali, it's a great pleasure to be here under the umbrella of the, of the Center for Iranian Studies. And thank you all very much for, for coming, for actually managing to find room 110 in the Paul Wembley building as well. So I think that's a major achievement, which you should be congratulated on. <laughs> Um, so, uh, so thank you, thank you very, very much. And um, it's a real pleasure uh, to be to be here. Um, Hamid, yet another book. Wow. So this is the book. And I'm afraid it's actually so heavy. Um, it's really wonderful. It's one of a, a series of books that Hamid has has written on this subject. You can't. I regret to say uh, that it was. Uh, I understand it a little bit complicated to get books here so that you could buy them. But basically, we're going to Hamid is going to try and sell you this book so that when you leave here, you are going to go onto Amazon or some other website um, and buy a copy of this book. So that's the aim today is really to look at this this uh, this wonderful book um, with you. Um, and it's uh, it's a it's you know I'm sure all of you know Hamid. Um, uh, uh, he's uh, he he spent a lot, he's he's been in this country for a very long time. Uh, he has in the past and he's been in, was teaching in Iran. And some of you may know that he's actually uh, teaching here for, for a while. Um, and I was privileged enough to actually, when I was at the British Museum, to be with him and his students when we kind of rifled through drawers and looked at art. Um, and they were all very enthusiastic. Uh, uh, to be taught and happy to be taught by by uh, by Hamid, um, and uh, now he's, as I understand it, he's uh, affiliated to Columbia um, University, and also he's had attachments at uh, at Oxford. But anyway, we're very pleased that he uh, he's here. Uh, Professor Hamid Dabashi, who is uh, who is up there somewhere, um, and he's coming he's coming to us from Colombia. And I mean, this is really amazing that you are here to join us, Professor Dabashi, because uh, if you just read your newspapers, you'll know that there is a lot going on in Colombia at the, at the moment. It's a very complicated time everywhere. We don't need to go into that necessarily uh, here, but very grateful to you, Professor Dabashi, for 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 doing for, for being with us today. Um, and um, as Ali said, uh, he has written so much 
um, made such a contribution to to the arts of Iran. And indeed, Mark Fels, the book that I, I know him best for is the book that he did with uh, Peter Chalkovsky, Staging a Revolution, the Art of Persuasion in the Islamic Republic of Iran in 2000, which was really an absolutely incredible, um, incredible book. Put it before 2000, anyway. But um, if you go onto his website at Columbia, you will see uh, as Ali said, like an incredible um, list of, uh, of publications. Um, and then, um, so he uh, he has, Professor Dabashi has an essay in this book, um, and he's going to be talking about that. Uh, he he takes a very interesting perspective on the Sakahani um, movement, which is which is very very interesting to to listen to. So this book, I should say, uh, comprises a series of essays. Hamid is going to tell us about about the the, the book in, in more detail, but it also in, includes essays by Hamid himself, this Hamid, and then Professor Dabashi. I'm going to get to, so we don't get confused with, between our Hamids, and if you don't mind, it. <laughs> just do it like that. Um, and uh, and then there is a, an, an essay, um, an excellent essay by uh, James Allen, who, who taught me um, when I was studying, and he is looking at the contemporary arts of, um, of Iran, but from that perspective of how uh, Iranian artists look at heritage and how they incorporate it in this most interesting way. Those of you who know about Iranian art will, will know that so many artists um, are totally um, absorbed by that long history of Iran and Iranian culture. Um, and it's it's very, the manifestations of that in their work is so incredible. So that essay is, is really very good indeed. Um, and then we have um, Razale uh, here, um, who is, uh, I, I would say, a, the kind of a token artist here. <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the best way possible. <laughs> Um, which is really wonderful uh, because she she lives here in 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 London um, and her and I really urge you to look at her website um, as, uh, because she it is absolutely extraordinary the range of work that she has been doing across many different mediums. Um, some of you might might know um, of her, might have seen that magnificent uh, installation she did in the Pre Sculpture Park in 2018. And in this book, when you get it, you will see she's on page 88 um, for that. And she has presented um, exhibitions in Tehran at the Albanbar uh, Gallery, um, and actually in London too with uh, yeah. with Salman. It's very nice to have you here, Salman. And and, um, and when it was a common place for her. And she's had various uh, other, uh, she's shown her work in many other places at the Africa Museum, Toronto Biennial, and, and, um, and so on. So our, what we're going to do today is we're, we're really here to talk about this, this book. Um, and so I'm going to um, be inviting each of our speakers to speak for about 10 minutes. Um, starting with Hamid, who's going to give us a kind of general um, overview, uh, and then and then we're going to go to uh, Professor Dabashi, um, and then to uh, Razali. Um, but I want to actually, before we start, I want to ask each of you a, a question. Um, and the first the first question really is to you, Hamid. Um, is you talk about um, you talk in your introduction, you talk about how what you're doing is a very different approach from the types of books on Iranian art which are focused on collections. And the title, the title of your book is Rethinking the Contemporary Art of, of Iran. Can you before you go into art, your, your kind of detailed look at the Absolutely. Could you tell us what, in, in a nutshell, is this rethinking about? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, do, it's not taking an issue for 10 minutes. So. No, no, <laughs> so no, no, no. You've got it's, your, it's don't, a, don't, don't worry, you've got your 10 minutes. Yeah, okay. It's just a little bit extra. It's <laughs> <laughs> <But short. laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, uh, basically, I, I've talked about the idea of uh, trend setting and also something that 
is being uh, basically uh, named as contemporary Iranian art in my earlier writings in a kind of critical uh, perspective. So um, in short, what I've tried to address in this book is somehow presenting a kind of different view of what is what I understand as contemporary art practices that uh, many of the subjects, approaches, or even artists have rarely appeared in any other uh, publications, uh, mainly based on collections or even exhibitions, because uh, you know, uh, with all respects with those collections, but they are based on the collector's taste mainly. But uh, so I tried really to uh, reintroduce or even uh, uh, perhaps uh, introduce a kind of different, uh, more comprehensive view of what is going on in Iran and for the first diaspora because it's been quite selectively yeah. so, that, uh, so that that then is reflected in the yes. the second part of the book the second with, part with, with book. Is, which is absolutely which is the, like a selection of artists where Ghazal is work yes is absolutely absolutely yeah. yes mm -hmm. so in i mean in my perspective so what have been included i mean all these artists and uh, even uh, textual uh, kind of writings uh, is trying to address this, that kind of deficiency within uh, art publications about contemporary art. Of your well, own. We can pick that up later. Sure. In the right. Thank you. That's that's, that's great. Good. So, Ghazali, I have a question for you before we add in, before we look at your work. So, um, so it's it's very interesting to to me that you so you born and brought up in in Tehran and you studied at Azad University. And so many artists that I've come across or learned about studied at Azad University in, uh, there are two Azads, aren't there? Yeah. So I'm really interested, what is it, what is it about Azad University that is so extraordinary and that has, has really sort of brought out so many interesting contemporary artists like you? So basically we have two types of university like related to, uh, uh, like private universities and public, which getting to those private, which is kind of governmental, we call it, it's kind of harder to get. And so many people who are able to get to those universities, they are not necessarily from art backgrounds. And that's why they get higher scores to get into those universities, like Danishka uh, Honar or like other universities. Azad is a bit more kind of has a bigger, wider doors for bigger spectrum of artists. Uh, in my case, I don't know how is it now. I haven't. I left Iran like twenty years ago, and I haven't. I rarely got back. But uh, in my case, I also, which is actually very rare uh, in other countries, you can go and do art in Iran in high school. So you don't have to do chemistry. You don't have to do anything. So you can immediately start making art in high school, and that's where I started art. And it's actually amazing that you learn a lot of skills, a lot of uh, techniques. Uh, and then um, when you go to university, there are a few disciplines, um, painting, sculpture, photography. And that's how I started. Uh, unfortunately, in my, my time, I don't know how it is now, but uh, it was more like a student teacher principles. Like you could easily see my work and say, who's my teacher? And it was it was a very uh, weird dynamic, and uh, I was the student of certain painters, and definitely I started as a painter, and my paintings were very similar to my professor. So Who when I professor uh, Muslimian, Mr. Muslimian, and uh, Puya uh, Aryanpur, okay. which you can see his work here, he was painter at the time. And when I left Iran, I kind of felt that I am not being very honest with my art. I the things I was talking in my art was all about Iran. My life was very different. So I decided to study again. And when I studied in London, it was just all about detoxing. I don't call it detoxing. It was not toxic, but it was more like 
on relearning, unlearning and relearning who I am, what I want to say. And that's yeah. how I came out such a same way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thank you. We'll hear okay. more about your work sure. in a second. But uh, so you, you, would you kick us off and uh, and tell us about this book? And then Professor Gabashi will we'll come straight to you. So we'll have each of the talks and then we'll have questions at the end. So. So please, while you hear our speakers, please like start thinking about the questions you want to ask them because we've got we've got a, a good length of time. So please, sure. thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> right, thank you very much, Monisha. Really, it's an honor that you are moderating this <laughs> event. And I also need to thank all the contributors, um, including writers, artists, curators, institutions, and also sponsors who made this project a reality. Um, so this is, uh, a, in this book, is actually a part of my ongoing research on the 20th and 21st century art of the Inner region, or West Asia and North Africa, particularly the focus on Iran and uh, exploring the recent developments and uh, practices and its relation to the context. Uh, so I'm going to Alijan. Yeah. I'll change this. So uh, I'm not going to talk about the details of uh, uh, this book's contents, but I mean, there are three main chapters, as we can see uh, in the beginning, uh, which somehow uh, contextualize the rest of the book and, uh, uh, you know, it serve as a kind of contextual framework of the for understanding of contemporary art of Iran, what I I believe it's something that I explained uh, is rarely happened before. And uh, this text uh, aim to provide a kind of multiple perspectives on contemporaneity and plurality and historical contexts. So I'm going to talk about my own uh, chapter mainly and uh, we are honored to have Professor Daboshi uh, yeah, and he's going to talk about his chapter, and uh, we can talk about, Anisha kindly talked about, very, very briefly about Professor Allen's chapter, and then, of course, the uh, second part of the book, which consists of uh, works of artists through three different categorization. So, about my own chapter, uh, in my essay, I... Uh, uh, explore the concept of phantasmagorical imageries, uh, something quite complicated, but uh, and its diverse uh, interpretations in the works of uh, artists, uh, both those, I mean, mainly those who are based in Iran, but uh, there are others who are not based in Iran, but related to this topic. I try to critically reassess uh, how this theme manifests itself in art practices in contemporary Iran, in particular, focus on uh, the strategies employed by artists on, I mean, to address personal and collective contradictions, mainly what is going on in the society, while uh, subverting cultural restrictions and standardization, again, basically imposed by the state, the Iranian state. My uh, main argument centers on the notion that uh, through these uh, visual representations, uh, phantasmagorical imageries, artists aim to challenge conventional understanding of how politics is conveyed in artworks uh, by the use of phantasmagorical imageries as a vehicle to challenge this situation. I talk about the uh, significance of phantasmagorical uh, connotations, meanings, and how they serve as a means to address sociopolitical themes implicitly. Maybe this is the only way that it's possible to address these themes in the context of Iran. And also how phantasmagoria uh, takes shape through enigmatic manifestations. Uh, 
in an environment uh, where artists need to bypass censorship in particular, where conveying critical messages uh, and so they close codes and ambiguity as a part of their toolkit. By juxtaposing unexpected images, textures, and uh, materials, these artists blur the boundaries between reality and fantasy. Several artists, uh, particularly from the uh, new generation, by new generation, I mean the book is basically uh, based on practices uh, executed during the past uh, two decades, from the 2010s on. So several artists of this generation use this strategy as a means to convey social and political commentary as well mentioned through metaphorical language, uh, symbolism and allegory, and also uh, by criticizing the power uh, structures, authorities and control and challenge in particular official master narratives. So, uh, I talk very briefly about a uh, few examples uh, that uh, were practiced by the earlier generations. Uh, artists such as Ali Ozoi Svahbot and uh, Arishir Mohasses, uh, which used the phantasmagorical image and uh, language in their works to address uh, social issues and political issues, <laughs> criticizing the status quo, etc. But the main focus is on uh, the works of artists that uh, uh, are subject, the main subject of the book. Mehdi Farhadion, for example, uh, applies a fantastical imagery to examine recent Iranian history and uh, the shared collective memory. His uh, works uh, drew from documentary images of the recent past, mainly photographic documents, focusing on elements that embody historical events, royal palaces, and depictions of uh, aristocratic experience, I mean, existence. However, uh, Farhadion's uh, versions, I mean, depictions, uh, depart from being simply factual representations of the past. Instead, in his uh, phantasmagorical images, uh, notions of splendor, authority, and national pride, or more important, even history, uh, are subject to critical inquiry through this language. Uh, we are young Poor's uh, project, uh, uh, Gone with the Wind, uh, the, the uh, I mean, there are other examples of his works as well, but I mean, in this section, I just concentrated on this one. Um, basically, his works examine the ever evolving socio political landscape of post revolutionary Iran. But in this uh, monumental and uh, gigantic and mesmerizing installation uh, that initially appears as a kind of silk fabric dancing in the air, but actually. It uh, comprises of 27 uh, substantial metal pieces covered by with mirror work. Our young Poole intentionally juxtaposes the structured geometric patterns of the mirror work with the fluidity uh, and the softness of the overall forms, creating a kind of captivating contradiction, something that uh, is perhaps a representation of what is going on in Iranian society. This physical suspension of elements mirror the enduring struggle within the collective Iranian experience where uncertainty prevails in the face of unpredictability. Another example is Behrang Samadzadegan's interpretive uh, narrative of contemporary Iranian history, uh, which does not merely represent historical visual documents, but uh, complexly juxtaposed uh, fragments drawn from diverse temporal and spatial contexts, as you can see in this image. These visual uh, constructs embody enigmatic amalgamations, most facets of the recent past and events 
to visualize and reconstruct the history rather than just depicting the history. And the last uh, image that I've selected from several others uh, here is mm -hmm. Alisat and the uh, project, uh, whatever it's called, installation, sculpture, uh, etc. cetera, uh, drawn from mainly uh, Shahnameh, the epic Shahnameh and uh, the mythical entities and stories. However, she personalizes the mythical stories through editions of aspects of womenhood, for example, uh, which transcends the realm of the mythical allegory and challenges the concept of categorical truth. For example, uh, her disfigured forms resonate with the assertion that myths are fleeting and the heavenly dichotomy, dichotomies of good and evil, light and darkness, are all relative concepts and subject of uh, criticism. So this is very briefly and <laughs> as briefly as possible, I could just uh, summarize this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. That's such a such an incredible array of images and your, your chapter. Um, is really so interesting. Um, so we, I'm sure there'll be questions of, about this uh, after. Now, Professor Dabashi, it, it's such a pleasure to, to, to have you here. Really, it's an absolute honor. Um, and um, I hope everything is all right with you over, over the other side there. Um, so, yes. so everything is, yeah. Uh, can you hear me, Dr. Porter? We can, we can all hear oh, you. Great, great. So, so uh... <laughs> yeah, so greetings to all of you from uh, Columbia University campus. In fact, over the last week, as you know, I'm not going to dwell on it. Uh, our students have uh, taken a very principled position on an issue which is of enormous importance to all of us. And we are very proud of them. And the university administration has made some unwise decisions by inviting police into our campus, uh, against which we members of the faculty have categorically stood and protected our students. We refuse to be a, a part of the university administration reprimanding, suspending, or uh, evicting at some point some of our students, both at Barnard College and Columbia. Uh, it is, and I'm, as I'm sure in Europe, as I'm sure in the UK, uh, young people, middle aged old makes no difference. It is important not to infantilize these movements that call them, you know, students or young people, etc. Yes, they are proudly young and they have the vision of their convictions, but at the same time, uh, it is a continuation of generations of uh, struggles. In fact, on our own campus, the last time an event of this magnitude happened was during the anti-war, anti-Vietnam War of 1968. Uh, but having just said that and putting it out, I am absolutely delighted, grateful to be part of this conver uh, uh, conversation. Uh, Dr. Porter, as you know, since the time that you were wisely and and competently uh, presiding over the events at the uh, British Museum, I've had the pleasure of uh, meeting you and having had contacts and conversations with you. I'm delighted to see you again. I wish I was there in person, but things are as they are. Now, that brings me to Hamid Kashmir Shikhan. All the sins that I have done in contemporary art and modern art and all of that is entirely Hamid Kashmir Shikhan's fault. Uh, were, it, were it not for Hamid, I'm just secluded into my own corner of thinking and about various things. Occasionally, I uh, write, feel compelled to say something about art. But it is truly Hamid uh, Kashmir Shikhan's vision of contemporary and modern art that has generously, kindly, and collegially found a space for my kind of thinking. Uh, this particular chapter of which Hamid has given an absolutely brilliant short summary in his own introduction of the issues that preoccupied me in this chapter, uh, came at a moment that I had just finished two books that one uh, 
Dr. Alavi just referred to generously, a Persian prince that has a peculiar construction. It begins with uh, a take on uh, Machiavelli, then goes to uh, Gramsci, constructs an archetype uh, of the idea of the Persian prince, but then towards the, the other half of the book, it brings to collapse the archetype into sub subcategories. Uh, one of them is the poet, is the other one, Hamid John. The one is the poet, one is the prophet, yeah. one is the rebel, and finally a pilgrim. The idea of pilgrim uh, is something that preoccupies me in that book considerably. So that book was just out of my uh, my. Uh, 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 I, I always consider myself a pottery maker. So I'm always pot pottering around. You just we finished it and send it. So the idea of the pilgrim was very much on my mind uh, when Hamid and I were uh, thinking about this uh, chapter. And I sent him a synopsis of what I wish to do. I was not planning to write on Sarokhane. As you know, Hamid himself has written on Sarokhane tradition since the late Karim Mami, who coined the word Sakohana tradition, there is a body of magnificent literature that Hamid's scholarship represents. Uh, but the idea of pilgrim, which I develop in this book, The Persian Prince, began to dovetail with the issue of Sakohana. But at the same time, another book that came after this uh, Hamidjan, if you uh, please put the, the idea of Mashi and Mashiana, which was just published by uh, Edinburgh University Press. Uh, in it, I developed the idea of the unknowing subject. So the title, the subtitle that you see in my essay for Hamid's book, The Unknowing Subject, comes from this book, which is an attempt to uh, see how through the visual and performing arts, this works particularly through the Iranian cinema, masters of Iranian cinema, how the uh, ancient mythology of Mashi and Mashione, uh, is uh, mitigated uh, metonymically in uh, contemporary art and leads to what I have uh, part and, uh, called a knowing subject. It has a philosophical twist to it, which I will not bother you with. Now, the my... my entrance into Sarokhane is uh, through the work of Abbas Kiorostami that over the last uh, few years I have been very preoccupied with it and particularly his uh, road series series of uh, photography that he did and uh, for varieties of reasons I have become increasingly attracted to these works on uh, Roads and sometimes a series is called Road and Rains. A series is called Roads of Kiarostami, and then uh, uh, Snow. Uh, some of them are snow, etc. But this idea of the road that you see uh, and uh, in Kiarostami began to sort of gel and come together in my mind with pilgrims and pilgrimage roads, roads that begin from somewhere and go to somewhere else, and uh, uh, in fact, some of the initial buildings of Sarokhane were, in fact, on these pilgrim, uh, road, uh, pilgrimage roads. And uh, then, of course, as a, I mean, all of us as a child, I'm old enough to remember these Sarokhanes, both in urban settings and rural settings and, and uh, in mausoleums uh, and shrines, uh, such as the one in, uh, in, uh, Imam, the, the eighth imam's shrine in Mashhad that as a child I frequently visited. So the idea of uh, of the road, of Kyorostami's road, which I started working on, dovetailed with the uh, uh, movement, art movement of Sakakhone, an absolutely extraordinary uh, event uh, in my judgment uh, in uh, contemporary Iranian history. Now, I began to uh, question the idea of modern because that is something I do, uh, uh, especially in the Iranian context, modern art or modernity, etc., is a contested area that I have been part of that uh, conversation, especially because the idea of modern and modernity and modernism uh, 
are perfectly legitimate European uh, concepts for European art and European uh, history and European literature and European uh, uh, culture. But when they come to non-European uh, sites such as Iran or anywhere else in Asia, Africa, Latin America, uh, they are through the intermediary uh, concept of colonialism. And as a result, we have to be careful with that concept. Uh, for, and it's not just concept, for example, uh, modernity and modernism. The idea of medieval is equally troubling uh, to be and problematic. Uh, uh, again, medieval in the context of Amer uh, European periodization makes perfect sense. But uh, to me, to say medieval Persian literature or medieval Islamic theology is entirely distorting because it is superimposing a periodization that is legitimate and even contested uh, by European historians and uh, scholars, uh, being sort of superimposing it on the uh, Iranian context or Arab context or Asian African context is distorting. So in my work over the last couple of decades, I've tried, tried to come up with internal dynamics and internal uh, uh, mechanisms through which we may come up with the periodization. By the internal, by old means, I always emphasize I'm not a nativist. I'm not saying that Iran has been somewhere on uh, planet moon and not uh, in contact and conversation with the rest of the world. But when we are talking about, uh, uh, for example, contemporary uh, Iranian art, as you just saw in Hamid's own absolutely brilliant essay on Phantasmagoria, that it is a particularly phenomenon. As I was listening to him, we might compare it to Latin American magic realism because it is in relationship to a particular political uh, parlance that requires a different kind of thinking. So th this is the way that through the uh, work that I did on Mashian Mashione and then on the idea of Pilgrim, when Hamid invited me to join him in this volume, I told him that I can talk about this issue of pilgrim and unknowing subject, but through Sagha Khone, because Sagha Khone, uh, the very term, as you all know, we, we owe it to uh, initial insight and brilliance of the late Karim Mami, uh, became a, a, an important issue. And But one of the, one of the reasons that I'm attracted to it is that Repeatedly, as Hamid says, Hamid Kashmir Shekhan says in his own scholarship, those who were engaged in Sagahane were very adamant that they are not traditionalists, that this is a new, this is a modern phenomenon, that they are not even, I mean, as if to be a Muslim or to be a Shi'i is a kind of a negative attribute. So that they were trying to distance themselves, that they only had artistic or aesthetic interest in these items. To me, they were protesting too much. And not that uh, I would doubt their, their own assessment of their own art. Every artist is entitled to their own interpretation. But here I use the, uh, the uh, triangulated uh, hermeneutics of Umberto Eco, the late uh, Italian hermeneutician, that yes, the intention of the artist and what the artist is doing uh, we are in the presence of Ghazale. So, so uh, uh, what I say is also important about Ghazale. The artist has, of course, a say as to what it is that they are doing. But at the same time, the text, Umberto Eco says, has its own resonances over which the artist does not have complete uh, control. And then the interpreter, the reader, the observer, the audience, the spectator also has uh, their own sense of uh, collection or assemblage of sensibilities. In that sense, I, uh, as it is because I am including in Sagakhone tradition people uh, and artists that who were not like uh, Amir Nadiri's photography, for example, or Bahman Jalali's photography, or uh, Azade uh, Akhlaqi's uh, photography, artists who have come to fruition and to work after. Uh, the term Sagakhone and the period of 1960s and 70s, uh, artists had sort of done their work uh, that if we expanded to include people like Farshid Meskhali or even uh, Siyah Armajani, who is sort of entirely in an American context, then we are in a historical 
position in a moment to look at the Sarkhone phenomenon slightly differently. Now, my initial uh, reaction was to carve a space, which in my work I call a tertiary uh, interstitial space, interstitial, which I a term I borrow from architecture, uh, is tertiary interstitial uh, space, which is neither modernity nor traditionalism, because I think these two binaries distort and uh, make us choose one or the other uh, against our will. Once we do that, I found the concept of the uh, of event as Hamid detected it in my uh, in my essay. The the, the concept of uh, uh, Alan Badiou's concept of event uh, important, and I make sort of uh, cautious and judicious references to Alan Badiou's idea of event. That this is an event. It's a moment of an event that uh, in. Uh, contemporary Iranian histories of 60s and 70s, that we have assimilated it backward. Uh, greatest scholars, would, for all of whom have an ending uh, admiration, we have been too much in a rush to uh, categorize it and read it and also foreclose it uh, for additional possibilities that the uh, next generations of uh, artists may bring into it. And uh, once we do that, and come to the uh, open-ended proposition of uh, looking at uh, the moment of the Sarkhan as an event, then we will be able to uh, perhaps liberate it from this false binary of modern, modern and tradition, and also the false binary that uh, this was just uh, borrowing from Sarkhan elements, but not part of the uh, work that I have called sort of Shi uh, aesthetic consciousness in my book on Shiism earlier, that uh, in the context of Shi history, there has been, at least since the uh, 16th century in Esfahan context, a sort of a bifurcation between over-politicization of uh, certain aspects of Shiism uh, and also leaving the aesthetic dimensions of Shiism unattended to. And one of the tasks that I have followed over the last few years is to see in what hidden or perhaps even overt ways aesthetic sensibilities of Shiism as something extremely embedded in Iranian uh, collective consciousness may manifest itself aesthetically and artistically. I first in, introduced this idea in my book on Shiism, A Religion of Protest, uh, more than a decade ago. And in, in the essay I wrote for Hamid, uh, I kind of revisited that. So all of that, and then I conclude right here, I think I'm running out of time. All of that is to see what happens to the person and the persona of the spectator who stands in front of this artist and begins to uh, reconvene the idea of the knowing subject, which I have uh, uh, sort of in a prolonged philosophical contestation with uh, Immanuel Kant, you know, instead of calling a knowing subject, I call an unknowing subject, which is a paradoxical phrase. At any rate, this is as much as I can share at this moment about the, uh, about the essay. I very much hope that you will all have time to grab hold of the book. It's a precious, precious book as all of Hamid Kishmir Shikans. If I had a chance when the book's cover was being desi designed, I would have asked the the uh, name of Hamid Kishmir Shikan to be the font of it three times, four times. It's too, it's just Hamid character. It's just so humble and so thing. That, that uh, font should have been like five times bigger. Uh, it is an exquisite book. I can't, I've seen the uh, PDF of it, but not the actual book. I'm a Gutenbergian. I need to put my hands on the book. I strongly recommend for all of you to uh, get hold of the book. I'm honored and privileged to be in, in Hamid's volume and uh, I look forward to seeing him. I haven't seen him for a long time and the rest of you in the near future. Thank you, Dr. Porter. Thank you, thank you so much. And thank you for that really, really interesting presentation. But I want to start where you started actually and to say that I personally salute you and many people in this room, I'm sure feel the same um, and wish you strength in what you're all trying to achieve there. 
Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, I, I also, um, I'm going to break what my, my rule actually, because <laughs> I want to just ask you a very quick question here. Um, it's very interesting the way you're looking at Sankarane and the way that you're thinking about, you're rethinking these definitions. Do you think that actually this term Sakatani is now a big distraction? Do you think actually that we should be doing away with the term, because nobody knows what to, of course, Hamid has written it extensively about it as in several other people. Um, and and people are defining it in different ways. You know, it's a movement or it's not a movement or whatever. Do, do you think it's a distraction? I'm, I'm happy, Dr. Porter, that you ask that because I say all but that let's dispense with it because I, I have to be cautious because we I am in the presence of not only Hamid Kishmir Shikan, but all, a whole tradition that goes back to Karim and Mami. And I'm very respectful of colleagues who have sort of designated this. But by kind of pushing the boundaries of what a Sagakhana art might be, I am hinting towards the prospect of perhaps sort of overcoming that definition. But I didn't wish in my work, I didn't feel uh, uh, allowed to kind of go that way. So, but I point towards that direction and I loosen the ending, the various uh, boundaries of the, the, the concept, both aesthetically, philosophically, politically, imaginatively, by including people that are ordinarily not included in Sagokhane tradition, by way of saying that, you know, mm -hmm. and if we are to hold it, we need to reconceptualize it, mm -hmm. but perhaps even dispense with it. And this is, again, uh, in my opinion, with all due respect to both the artists and the art uh, historians and art critics who wrote on Sagakhane, I'm not very uh, sanguine of dismissing their work that they didn't know what they were talking about. Of course they knew uh, what they were talking about. But at the same time, uh, we, we are half a century after that moment. So there are new generations of artists. There are ways of conceptually and philosophically sort of uh, unleash that concept in a different direction. So yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, so now we come to you, Azale, and um, sorry, I rather rudely just said you were the token artist. It's, you're far from token artist. <laughs> it, 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 it would have been too complicated to have all the artists who are in this book, but it's such a privilege to, ha to have you here, to be part of this conversation. And also, I, I, you just told me that you're doing a show next year. You've got a solo show at the Haywood, so we are all really looking forward to coming to that. Now, please tell us something about your, your work through the slides. Would you like to Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm really, really honored to be here with uh these amazing people, some of them were some, sometimes my, my professors, and uh, their books were my guidance to the art world. And now I'm being in conversation is like a dream come true. And also being part of uh, Hamid Kishmir Shikan's book, which is an absolutely beautiful book, really extensive and really covering a lot of subjects in the art Iranian art world. When um, I was invited uh, to do uh, this talk and being part of the book, a question that I'm trying to avoid came back to me, came on the surface. How much my work is Iranian and how much me being Iranian and how am I relevant to this whole context? As I said, I left Iran 20 years ago. I rarely go back to Iran. The topics I'm talking about, they are not necessarily talking about uh, the sociopolitical uh, uh, subjects, matters that are happening in Iran. And that kind of, again, made me in the last few days i was just like constantly thinking why 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 have i been chosen and why am i here and um, going through my works again remembering a lot of things and i prepared to start with picture with this picture i'm not going to go through every single work uh i'm just going to have the works as a backdrop of my uh talk and uh, tell you why I'm here. Um, I was uh, born and bred in Iran, left when I was 20, and uh, I was a painter, but when I got out of Iran, I 
kind of tried to, I felt like painting is not enough. I need to save, I need, I need more medium, I need materials. And then I started without even being trained in sculpture, I started making um, sculptures. And uh, that was a really scary moment. I was in London uh, doing sculpture, not knowing materials and uh, trying to unlearn and learn everything uh, again on my own. And uh, not talking about what I was facing in Iran or the things, that, the old topics that I was dealing, which was my body, being female, feminine, censorships and all that. And uh, gradually I started noticing that there is this thing is becoming very prominent in my work, which was the idea of game and play which later you will see if you are Iranian with, if you're familiar with Iranian context, you know how everything is gayful, playful, from the culture, jokes, everything to the politics and bigger things. And that's how I started making art. And in my practice, in many ways, I try to kind of look at things through the lens of game and play. And uh, like through this lens, I'm looking at education system, I'm looking at romance, I'm looking at um, politics, language, many things. And uh, the reason I chose this picture because recently I was very much interested in those people who are watching games, those people who uh, are gambling around the idea of games, how the politics, how the money being circulated, which is very similar to what is happening in the world now. And um, mm, we or us as who are standing here sitting here and watching what is happening in the world is like some it's a subject matter for me we are like watching that game that is happening like there are seven, 17 active war now is happening in the world and um, I was very interested about this spectatorship uh, so in this project, I uh, worked with uh, cockfighting trying to kind of mix this idea of like being seated and being the cock and like create this confused moment that you can be the victim and victor at the same time. Then gradually I was more interested in the idea of like theater, the materials, the sitting system, uh, the fabrics, the everything, everything that is being used in a theater's format, uh, the stage, the backstage, uh, and what is happening. So these are like gradually stepping a bit further from the idea of game and like being more focusing on those who are designing the game which they can be teachers, can be a governing system. It can be it can be those who are designing religion or anything like that. So these are my studies on sitting system, the ticketing, the height, how you see, where you see. Um, and then this work uh, is another example of like how uh, I got closer to the idea of game uh, as, a, as a game material. Uh, these are... Uh, 300 uh, speeding tops that they were all uh, taken from one object. Like the light was provided, was uh, like there was a source of light that was constantly playing around this one object. And the shadows were like 300 different shadows. And then some of them were fine. And then the, the shadows were sculptured, like digitally sculpturalized. And this is what you're seeing. So some of them are. Uh, functioning, some of them are not functioning, who is actually spinning them, the ones that are being spinned, how they are like kind of creating this battlefield killing or throwing out the other non-functioning uh, tops. These were all like uh, the things that I was talking and uh, the things that I see around in the society. Then later I worked with this um, material, <laughs> which is a mulch uh, that you see it in the playgrounds. Um, I was actually very shocked when I uh, left Iran with the hope that the, the Western war is going to be free. And then you realize that there is different sort of censorship and how much you how like how much of your uh, freedom you give to be safe. Yes, you get more safety, but also you give a lot of your freedom, which in a way, maybe you don't give that much in the other side of the world. So I was kind of playing with this idea of like playgrounds and how much it's kind of cushioning the floor for children. Children can play on the ground, but actually their speed is really controlled and uh, they cannot move as freely as possible. So it's all the idea of like the surfaces that has been designed to give us safety, but actually um, they are not really safe. They're taking a lot of our freedom. 
then I was talking about this back to the idea of the cockfighting inside, outside, where you're standing institutions. And this is a piece that most of you uh, might be familiar. It's a mashrabiya that is made in the Middle East to uh, create some sort of a privacy shadow. Uh, so when you're outside, you don't see inside, but when you're inside, you have the power to see what is happening outside. So I kind of create this dynamic on a museum. I like to see it on a church. I like to see it on a bank or like a main uh, headquarter of a bank, like the power, the power that they have, how, where you're standing and when you're an outsider, how it works, this playful <coughs> game of being inside, being included or not. I work a lot with different materials, with soap, with the, uh, this is a soap project that I did in Dhaka Art Summit and uh, I work with uh, butter. Uh, I like to work with things that react invisibly to the surrounding and measuring time and measuring the temperature and that invisible control that I'm constantly talking about. You can see it. The butter is constantly melting and changing depending on how many people are coming to the surface. And the last thing is um, the piece that is actually being at uh, Master Kashmir Shekhan's uh, book. Uh, this is a piece uh, that I did in 2008, uh, which is a dismantled playground, distorted. Uh, it's very familiar. It's, 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 for me, it's about memory. It's about how you make uh, mm, kind of uh, like how you kind of destruct, how you change it, how you kind of. The, the most interesting part about this piece was that when children was like seeing this from afar, they were like running into it and they, it was very familiar to them. And there was this shocking moment and puzzle in their eyes that like, what is this? This is something that they wanted to play with and they could see that this is something that they want. So I kind of always like in my work to kind of use materials that, that's why you see a lot of different things that on their own, they have the message and history. So, uh, yeah, I mean, this 10 minutes is not really long enough to talk about mm -hmm. what I'm doing, but this was a kind of an introduction uh, about my practice. And yeah. Thank you. Thank no you. Worries. Thank you so much. So interesting. I want to I want to just um pick up on that question that you are you are asking yourself, how Iranian am I? Um, and I was I was really struck by um going through your website, which is such a pleasure to go through, really. Um and and so sort of towards the end, I found these textiles which had sort of um, uh, representations of the Shalame and <clears throat> and so on. So can we go back to that question of how how Iranian do you feel? And also, do you get really annoyed when people um, define you as an Iranian artist? Like, like, of course, it's wonderful to be in Hamid's book, but you are being defined in this book as an Iranian artist. No, 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 definitely no. not. I'm not being annoyed or anything no, like I'm that. Just it's, like, just, <laughs> I'm, it's just like... Uh, Definitely I am, definitely I'm being fed, definitely the mentality and the structure I'm talking about is coming from my being an Iranian, it's it's from my nationality, but it's not directly talking about what is happening, or this regime, or yeah. this government, or what is happening right now in Iran. It's I'm trying to make it more international, because it's Iran is an example for me to talk about Yemen, to talk about bigger pictures, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, no, I'm not uh, trying to stay away or, like, define myself as, like, yeah. non, non, or, like, I don't know what I'm, no, but it's totally... Uh, just I try to be very honest with my practice because also I don't allow myself to talk about things that I'm not hate, like touching it with my bones in Iran. You know what I mean? I'm not there. So I'm like trying to just depict my own experience, my life experience. I am constantly moving around. I've lived in many countries. So I'm trying to kind of represent that in my practice to yeah. what I've seen, what I've experienced. Yeah. No, that's so interesting. And I love particularly the, all the titles that you give your works. I mean, I'm so bored of these, you know, untitled. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 um, and actually, it feels like the titles that you give, the, the one about the butter, you know, the scratch. Yeah. From, you know, yeah. I, I love that because it's kind of, it so connects to um, 
Yes, yeah. no, it's important. Yeah. I, I think if I was a, not a visual artist, I would have been a filmmaker. I really, although I'm like, it's a, it's a material that I've never worked with, but playing with words and like titling, I love movies and they're with their interesting titles. So I'm always trying to use uh, that sort of techniques. For and I feel, I feel sure you're going to be making movies soon. It's going to be the <laughs> next nice nice animation. Oh, yeah. well, so, yeah. yes. <laughs> and we all look forward to seeing your show. Thank in the you. head. I will Thank come you. back. I'm sure the people in the audience have got questions. Thank but you. I've got something for you, for you, um, Hamid. Um, so, so interesting, the, the, your choice of, of artists in this, in this book. So what was the main right criterion that you use mm -hmm. to choose your, you know, because you must have looked at dozens and dozens, I didn't count how many you've got. Left. So how did you actually arrive at that selection? Because you had the world to look yeah. at, I mean, artists from everywhere. Uh, absolutely, yes, I think it was very challenging, I must say, you know, I, you know that I've been working on this topic in, in, mm -hmm. for almost decades, yeah. but I mean, that was, uh, quite extraordinary experience actually working on uh, works that I was not familiar with. I mean new developments during the past. So what decade. were you looking for? Were yeah, you maybe. when you when you had in front of you like a table full of pictures? I mean what oh. were you what was it that jumped out at you from each artist that you selected? You know, I started with for example 500 and uh, then we reached to about 190. And so, as I said, uh, I really avoided that sort of classification or that sort of essentialized idea of Iranian or Iranian art, as I just said. So, as, as Ali mentioned, she, she, I mean, many people might not really realize that uh, I mean, if they just see her works, it's, it's, it's Iranian, mm -hmm. I mean, in that sense. Okay. And I really tried to avoid those kinds of classification mm -hmm. and those kinds of essentialized idea of what is Iranian. Like, for example, those, um, well, uh, traditional uh, depictions, uh, our cultural heritage, that sort of things that have become cliches right now. Uh, or, for example, very vivid, explicit sort of kinds of political mm -hmm. depictions, uh, feminism, or that mm -hmm. sort of, of course, there are artists who have been included who uh, address issues, yeah. personalized issues, women who mm -hmm. feminism and other things. But I mean, it's not based on that sort of cliche idea yeah. of what is Iranian. So uh, even in the chapter, I mean, the section which uh, includes the works of artists who have been, and so I, I just named it Echo of mm -hmm. History yeah. rather than other things. Yeah. So, uh, and uh, James also has written about it. Mm -hmm. So we had a lot of conversation about that, that we don't really want to follow the same path that uh, when we are talking about uh, reference to, to traditional materials that doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, commemorating those uh, traditions or uh, reviving them. But in, on many occasions, they are just using uh, these as vehicles to address critical issues, even criticize those materials. Yeah, exactly. So these are the things, I mean, uh, but I mean, as I said, I tried to be quite comprehensive in terms mm -hmm. of selection and, uh, avoiding those uh, uh, kinds of um, uh, trend-setting approaches. But can I ask you, um, sorry to jump in, um, uh, when, you were, when you had your pool of, of 500 disciples, were you, were you interested in whether the artists were still based in Iran or whether you might be them diasporic artists? Were you interested in, in, in that distinction or, or not at all? Uh, I have been interested, certainly, and but I mean, in this particular book, I didn't divide them into two different no, not at all. of course. But I think the majority, because the majority of artists are living in Iran, I mean, in comparison, if we just count them, actually, in terms of portion, there are many more who are living in Iran, so... In the, in the book. In the book, yeah. yes, uh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, uh, during my research, I just selected those artists, uh, again, who would uh, really depict or portray a different sort of uh, portrayal of Iranian art, or I, I really avoid, I mean, 
I'm very reluctant to use Iranian art, but I mean, art of Iran, that's why yeah. I just... That all uh, very important. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, art true. of Iran. Yeah. So something which is related to Iran or yeah. affiliated to Iran. Absolutely. So, uh, yes, I mean, that, that's the main criteria. And above that, above all, perhaps something that I would realize as contemporary. Uh, even if there are a few artists from the earlier generations uh, that have been included in this book, those are the, I mean, artists who have not been included in any yeah. prior publications, but there are, their works show quite, I mean, parallels and also dialogue with the yeah. new generations, exactly. but there are not very many. Yeah. No, it's a very, very interesting selection. Now, I'm hoping that you wonderful audience here that you've got you've got some burning questions so i'm going to who's got the first burning question i can go on asking the questions but i'd much rather hear from from, from you so what can i just say something oh, uh, there are a number of other artists who have been included in this book oh, very so we are good. privileged to have them How lovely. i mean uh, i don't so great. maybe you could, can you put up your hands you other artists too oh fantastic i mean please oh do <laughs> Well, I don't, I don't, I, can, I haven't got the right glasses, so I can't see who you are. Anyway. <laughs> but, uh, but like, t tell us, t tell us who you are. I'm a painter. That's yeah. it. <laughs> like, maybe give us your name. For those of you, for those of us ignorant people like me. My name is Amiru Simbayu. Yeah. A privilege to have you here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wonderful. Any other artists here? Yes. Raymond. 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 Yeah, wonderful. And I'm also, yeah, I'm, I'm also, I'm included. I'm, I'm Bijan Musavi. I do multimedia stuff, uh, uh, work mainly about neoliberalism. Amazing. Gosh, what a, what a privilege to, to have you here. Um, thank, you. thank you. So, um, any questions here that are, that are emerging out of, out of this conversation? Uh, Professor Dabashi, I'm going to ask you. I want to just pick up on that that question of um, of the diaspora in terms of um, you know whether whether uh, what is that that distinction? Can one just see automatically when you look at the work of an, an artist? Do you just want, can, can one think about that notion of being a diasporic a diasporic artist or not? Um, is, is it I mean, I'm very interested in, you know, for example, when one looks at the work of Nikki Nujui, for example, that um, that that even though he's been living in the States for, for decades, a lot of the work that he makes actually references that time in 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 Iran um, when he he suffered, um, and he goes back to that again and again and again. It's as though it's completely embedded in him and his practice. I wondered if you had some thoughts on that matter. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in fact, one aspect of my idea of pilgrim, zair pilgrim, is because I'm not happy with this idea of expat or. Uh, or diaspora or anything of that sort. I always say, put it provocatively, I'm an Iranian who lives in New York. So and there are Iranians who live in Khuramabad and there are Iranians who live in New York and that's the end of it. It's a particularly Tehran based thing, Imagic, you know, at, uh, are you in Iran or outside Iran? And my, my uh, the point that I was going to make to, to Razal about the, am I Iranian or am I not Iranian? Who am I? <laughs> there is nothing, there is no more question, no more Iranian question than that question. Am I Iranian? It goes, it goes, it goes back to Rumi, as Koja Amadam, Amadanam as Bahr Chibud, is as early as 13th century. I recommend reading, for example, Sohravardi. Sohravardi, some, in one of his essays, Agle Sorkh, Red Intellect, a uh, friend asks him, uh, listen, do birds speak? Do they have a language? Say, yeah, of course birds speak. And the friend says, how do you know? He says, well, I used to be a bird myself. <laughs> and, and the rest of it follows. One of the most glorious uh, Persian uh, visionary recitals of Sohra Vardi. I mean, no, you don't have to go there. Just read, uh, you know, Sohra Shahid Salis. Man be mehmani dunya raftam. I went to a festive gathering of the world and it doesn't have to a person move to London or Paris or uh, anywhere else 
people like Sohravardi, like uh, uh, Sepehri, they lived inside Iran mostly. And then, I mean, Sohravardi was in Aleppo uh, when he was writing these things. So being in, in Iran, born and raised inside Iran, doesn't mean that they are not thinking globally, that their mind and soul is not all over the place. So it is, in my judgment, a false binary that uh, somebody has to physically move out of Tehran and uh, then to be uh, to think whether or not their art is Iranian. They could be perfectly inside Iran, and yet you are not rooted in the lived experiences of uh, people around you. And you could be uh, moving outside Iran, uh, uh, as many examples. Uh, Brecht learned about Fiat uh, Ramdung's effect when he saw a Chinese uh, uh, art. You know, uh, rather, uh, 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 you know, the examples are many Russian, uh, Irish uh, uh, thinkers, uh, philosophers, uh, novelists, etc., who came to their idea when they were outside Iran. So, no. And the example that you give uh, Dr. Porter about Nikki Nejumi, that we can also amplify it with Adeshir Mohasses is very important that the, the, the visual vocabulary of their work was actually formed inside Iran. And then they lived a lifetime outside Iran, but they perfected that visual vocabulary. They didn't change it. Amir Nader is another example. His visual vocabulary was formed inside Iran. And then he has made movies in New York, in Japan, in Italy, uh, all over the place, but he remains the same filmmaker. He just has, uh, has expanded. And uh, I would give an example of, say, if we reverse it, look at Darush Mehrjui. He, you know, scarcely traveled outside except for his student years in California. Uh, but yet his cinema became increasingly global. Bahram Bezai, you know, the examples are many. Uh, still, he lives physically in California, but he's really still preoccupied with the Iranian mythology as he has always been. So I think, uh, I mean, the Ghazali's point about not living inside Iran has a legitimacy, but the, the, there is a new organicity uh, to being an artist. Uh, uh, that that new organicity means being fully aware of issues happening in Palestine, happening in uh, anywhere else in the world. Uh, so uh, the, the, the soul of the artist, if I were to speak for that for a mo moment, is always uh, universal. The issue has been that the a particularity of an Iranian artist or an Arab artist or a Chinese artist has not been universalized yet, theoretically, whereas the European artist's particularity has been universalized. So we need thematically, theoretically, to de-universalize uh, the false universalization of the European artists and begin to think of the universal, universal dimensions of an Iranian artist and how their particularity needs to be uh, expanded. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Dabashi, I would like to elaborate on what I said. When the umbrella of like Iranian art or arts of Iran comes along, similar to any other marginalized uh, Topics like if someone asked me to participate in a women uh, only women exhibition or Middle Eastern female artist exhibition, mm -hmm. again this question comes back to me. When they I be marginalized as that as a person, I don't have I don't really ask this. I don't have this political identity issues. But as when it comes to my art and being marginalized in this format, then I'm like, why is this art being marginalized as a female artists, how feminine my art is, you know what I mean? I absolutely agree. If I may, Dr. Porter, just respond for one minute. I absolutely agree. But you are not as a victim of that marginalization. You as an artist are not marginal. You are central to your own art and as a result, the centrality of your art to the world around you. So there are all, all kinds of categories, uh, you women artists, Iranian artists, Muslim artists, whatever that uh, uh, stereotype that is being chasing after you, but you're not the victim of them. Uh, you're, you have extraordinary agency, especially as an artist, to, uh, to uh, sort of demarginalize yourself. You're not marginal. Can I repeat 
can as we've got some other artists in the in the room here. I mean, do you have a comment, Artist Vita? Emma, I mean, about, about this notion, it's such an interesting. interesting. Um, I, I just wonder if, um, I mean, um, in his rethinking, um, did you collaborate with any art gallery in Iran, particularly? I could recognize um, Aran, for example, with very nice cactus made from fabric. Mm -hmm. That is cool. Did you collaborate with oh, Yes, in yes. Art yeah, I, I mean, because. Uh, I have not been in Iran since about seven years ago. So I didn't have direct access. I mean, we didn't have direct access to those artists, many of them who were, I mean, <clears throat> new generations and I didn't know them. So uh, I was in touch with many galleries and institutions inside Iran, including those that you mentioned, yes. And uh, they helped a lot with introducing um, their artists and uh, sharing their lists of artists and it's, yes, absolutely. But it it is it was not limited to those galleries only. Yes. Never seen such a I've never seen such a quiet audience. <laughs> yeah. Ah, very good. Thank you. Um. um First of all, thank you so much for such a amazing events and uh, brilliant uh, speakers. Um, I uh, uh, my question is from Dr. Um Can you please elaborate on the concept of contradiction? Of course, I would read your book, but uh, for now, I'm very much interested to know how you frame the concept of contradiction and. Um, uh, I'm wondering if this concept somehow is related to what Professor Dabushi mentioned as an interest, she, sorry, interstitiality, uh, something that a sort of framework that helps us to go beyond the way, a binary way of thinking and so on, or it's a negative concept. Sure. I mean, um... Well, could you just uh, a little bit say about where you just heard about contradiction? But I, about it's in, um, yes, I mean, uh, that was something uh, I think quite perhaps different when I was talking about uh, how artists are using that phantasmagorical imagery to address contradictions. I mean, that contradictions that exist within the society. I mean, that's something that uh, uh, those Iranians who are living in the society yes. are grappling with contradictions, <clears throat> different sorts of contradictions in the society. I mean, uh, the work of, uh, for example, uh, Uyar Yampur, as I just mentioned, the softness in contrast with the solidity of the piece. So uh, that sort of contradictory elements would represent the contradiction existing in society. So uh, uh, there are several elements that we could find in politics, in uh, culture and other things which promote this contradiction that <clears throat> we see. This is what I mean by contradictions and, uh, yeah, within the society. Thank you. Yeah, please, uh, some of them. I have a question for Dr. Kashmish again and Dr. Dabashi. Uh, back to contradiction. Of course, we have to read the book. I'm sure the, the answer is in the book. But having a chapter about Saqa Khane in the book that titled Rethinking Contemporary Iranian Art, what do you think about Because like a Saqa Khane is a modern movement. It's not a contemporary movement, but what, how do you relate this to chapter, the chapter and the subject of the book? I mean, I think uh, Professor Dabashi will, uh, has uh, elaborated uh, uh, much better. But what I understand, uh, and uh, Professor Dabashi uh, mentioned in uh, his brief uh, talk today, uh, is that what he tries to define in that chapter is that uh, 
what we know about the concept of the contemporary is different, could be different, could be elaborated further. And also the question of uh, the concept of modern art, as we know, and I myself started and uh, I have been subject of criticism in that essay about modernism and modern art and Sakal Khane as a modern art movement or tendency, whatever. Uh, Professor Daboshi is trying to redefine that. And so Sakal Khane as the concept uh, which is contemporary rather than modern. So, uh, which is quite related uh, to uh, the book and its title. But I'm sure Professor Daboshi um, be able to elaborate your very briefly i think you said it right and as the friend who asked the question rightly said uh they should kindly take time and read the chapter uh uh it's a peculiar aspect of iranian intellectual just from the title they begin to write a whole critique of uh of the essay just on the title uh, but do please um, take time and read as hamid said these two cliche concepts, contemporary and modern, uh, they are not carved in stone. They are not descended from heaven. They need to be critically re-examined. And my attempt is simply to play uh, with, on the etymological and uh, idiomatic uh, expression, contemporary, moasir, and uh, modern, modern, and begin to uh, to wonder if the term muasir uh, is a term that we need to dwell on uh, in order to understand the concepts and ideas and schools of Sagha uh, Khane. And, uh, but as I said to Dr. Porter earlier, I do this very cautiously and judiciously and respectfully to previous generations of scholars and artists who have uh, come up with these terms. And yes, the friend who's asking this question is absolutely correct. Sagha um, Khane uh, tradition has been uh, considered a modern phenomenon. And as you see in the phrase tradition modern, there's already a paradox uh, in there. So I would hope that uh, people will start reading the book and considering its arguments uh, and then reflecting on the argument. Thank you. Are there any other Yes, please. I was actually thinking about what Mr. Daboshi said about the uh, sort of like the colonial way that modernism has, has kind of like moved to Iran. Um, I mean, I, I just couldn't uh, like stop thinking about sort of like some of the advancements in uh, basically uh, the modern movement in uh, uh, the West, in Europe. Uh, sort of was kind of like, you know, like in line with scientific advancements of the time. So, for instance, you can say that um, what cubism does, it actually, it starts looking at sort of like the 2D kind of like uh, limitations, li limitations of the representation of the 3D world. So, you know, so, I mean, to me, this sounds something like quite universal and, and to be honest, like not necessarily something that, uh, you know, a single uh, uh, kind of like universality or like a universality from a specific like geographical location, uh, uh, you know, would come up with, um, you know, and, and I think sort of like I'm kind of like thinking more of in terms of how like a, like a kind of a, a total dis dismissal of, of kind of like the whole of the modernity uh, from the contemporary point of view of, of, of the times that we live in. Uh, uh, by in a way sort of like, you know, like resorting into some um, kind of like traditions, which even I would say maybe sometimes the global South people are, are not even really kind of like interested in. Uh, I was interested to see what your view on this. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, critical engagement with the concept of modernity. I did not invent it. I'm part of a group of people who are who are doing this. And critical engagement doesn't mean total rejection. Uh, these are two different. There is a difference between anti-modernism and criti uh, critique of modernism or anti-modernity and critique of modernity. And that is uh, something that uh, is, as I said, is a global phenomenon. People, is not even in global South, global North. 
uh, the, uh, uh, Amy Kaplan just wrote a book, The End of Progress, which is a critique of the school of uh, the Frankfurt School. Uh, so the example that you gave of uh, cubism and and science uh, is a, is a good example, but the issue is it is not universal. It's presumed to be universal. Science itself and the uh, homocentricity of science has been questioned particularly in the age of uh, right now environmental catastrophe and the critique of anthropocentrism has been questioned. So we need to historicize the particular moment of universalization of uh, uh, modernity. When, once we historicize it from our uh, contemporary perspective, a perspective that uh, has seen the calamities, uh, environmental calamities, human calamities that this uh, homocentricity has created, then we begin to question whether or not that homocentricity, uh, given the father of uh, uh, enlightenment, uh, Immanuel Kant's conception of human, which was a European human, not a global human, uh, he did not think a, a, a human being from Africa was capable of being human, then you begin to question the globality of it. I recently wrote a, 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 an essay on, on Habermas and the fact that the death of tens of thousands of human beings <laughs> in, in a part of the world that he just doesn't consider them human beings. But this is not an element of racism. This is an element of uh, or racism alone. This is an element, element of epistemological incapacity to uh, center uh, when and, and I give you an example entirely European. Uh, Gramsci somewhere in uh, in prison notebook uh, is reading Immanuel Kant's uh, groundwork for the metaphysics of morals, in which Kant says, behave as if your behavior was a universal stand. And Gramsci says, can I also say that? I, as an Italian, can I say that? To which he answers, no, I cannot, because the eye of Immanuel Kant is universalized and my eye is not universalized. So we need to go to the uh, philosophical roots of this, uh, uh, the, this phenomenon known as modernity. And in order to see why it is not just homocentricity, is Eurocentricity, is the European male, not just European person that is at the epi epicenter of all those scientific uh, things. Again, none of what I say is just sort of earth shattering revelation. This is part of a literature that unfortunately is fundamentally lacking in Iranian intellectual scene, uh, for which Iranian intellectuals themselves are not to blame. It's just the calamity of the Islamic Republic of the last uh, half a century destroyed uh, intellectual tradition that is uh, started be before. Thank you so much for, for, the, for that for those those thoughts. But before we we close, because um, our, our time is up, I just want to very quickly ask you: What is the? To, can you give us a sneak, like, tell us something about the exhibition that we're going to see at the Haywood Gallery next year? Are we going to be surprised? What are, what are we going to see? Tell us what you're working on. Uh, it's actually going to be two venues in London. One is going to be at Delphina Foundation wow. and uh, Hayward. So they're going to open at the same night. They're going to, it's going to be a playful exhibition. I can't say much, but uh, you need to see the, uh, two spaces in order to understand the whole narration I'm talking about. So one is responding to the other. And uh, yeah, hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a continuation of my practice. It's a, uh, uh, it's about failure, it's about uh, things that are not working, it's about manuals, the manuals that are not guiding, it's about all those aspects that I'm talking about in another way. I'm sure it's going to be so enriching and wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. And uh, Hamid, uh, I can't believe that there isn't another book which is <laughs> just dating somewhere. So what's what's that? What, what, what are you working on now, now that this is out? Sure. I mean, uh, basically, there is a conference is coming up. I mean, in October, so uh, which is an international conference on contemporary art, Wonderful. and also the concept of history. Lovely. So, you yes. could be here. And so us. Well, yes. we'll all, I'm sure we'll all yeah. we'll all be there. Well, sure. and and uh, Professor Dabashi, what are you what are you working on now? 
I can't believe you're just sitting <laughs> idly. <laughs> Oh, I, no. I, I I mute myself when I'm not talking so I wouldn't disturb people. Now, what am I working on? Right now, we're trying to protect ourselves from uh, National Guard invading our campus. Uh, <laughs> we, don't, we don't know if uh, our, our campus becomes like Tehran University campus, uh, you know, by uh, Ansar Hezbollah of uh, this... <laughs> this uh, this country, but uh, I, I don't mean to be dismissed.